real quick that I'm not Brother Sutherland. He's got uh, hair. Uh, it's gray. His turned gray since I've known him, but mine turned loose. Amen. But we're glad we're being here to be in this meeting. We have been much in prayer for you and uh, have felt like that God has, has been here in the meeting thus far. And uh, we, uh, we came here because we love you all. And uh, uh, Brother L.D. Moore looked at me one time and he said, Brother Downey, he said, you mountain people. I said, you're different. Well, we're different in one way. If we are friends, we're friends. Amen. And we'll come across the mountains to stand and help each other. So that's what we're here for tonight, to be with you. Amen. And I appreciate the preaching today. That was Brother Charles at his classic best. And uh, uh, incidentally, I am Brent Gabbard's dad. There was a time, you know, that uh, Brother Charles, they, they said that's uh, Brother John Gabbard's boy, but now it's, uh, you know, I'm Brent Gabbard's dad. Amen. I'm glad to be with him today. And uh, he's, he, I'm proud of what he's doing for God and where he's working at. I've had something I've been chasing around inside my head for about a month here. I don't know that I've got a handle on it, but it's the only thing I brought here for this meeting. Now, since I've been here, God's dealt with me, but I brought this with me, and I've never tried to preach it, and that's going to make Ann nervous. But uh, I want you to turn with me tonight to the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm number 78. The book of Psalms and Psalm number 78, and uh, we're going to begin reading with verse number 1. Psalm 78 and verse number 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he hath established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he hath commanded our fathers that they should make them known unto their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them unto their children. I uh, want you to look at the first part of this verse number six, and that's the title of our text tonight, that the generation to come might know. Father, we're here tonight in this place, partly because of the invitation, but more so, God, because of the obligation. And so, Father, tonight I pray that you would uh, again, Again, Lord, let the canopy of your glory settle on this congregation again tonight. Lord, that you would stretch forth your hand among us and confirm your word to us by signs and miracles and wonders. And Father, all that you've done and all that you're doing, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. And now at the conclusion of these broken remarks tonight, would you meet us on these altars again? And again, we'll praise you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And the congregation said, Amen. Our psalmist tonight is addressing a people with all the, the power and all the authority and all the anointing of a prophet. He has but one purpose, and that is to tell the coming generation of the glorious deeds of the Lord, to challenge and remind them of God's law, to bring that law before them in a way, and his hope is that they will hear that which uh, they have uh, uh, not heard and that this new generation will set their hope in God and will learn to keep his commandments. Amen. Uh, we have, uh, you know, it, it is God's way. I, I prayed, I have prayed for a while. What is it? We are in a transition period. The old men are moving off the stage and young men are coming on. There's some great young men, but there's some things that are troubling me. 
And I've asked God why that it seemed like we could have a breakout and a break move in a, in a, this week and next week uh, we're out doing something else. And I feel like that, that, that what we've failed in, and I, I'm not uh, jumping on us tonight and I ain't about to jump out. But I feel like we have failed this generation coming up because uh, it's God's plan that every generation take it for themselves. I feel like that we have tried to hand them the answer sheet without ever giving them the book. Our schools are turning out scores of illiterate people because uh, the bottom line is uh, they want, they're wondering what the score is going to be. And so they're handing them the answers. We have handed the answers to this generation and said this is what it is. But they have never studied the book for themselves. They've never settled it for themselves. They, they have the answers, but they do not understand the, the, the mathematics and the problematics of getting it all together. The book of Judges chapter 3 and verse 2 has an unusual sec, uh, uh, says that now these are the nations which the Lord left, verse 1 of chapter 3, to provide Israel even as many of Israel has not known all the wars of Canaan. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At least such has not, has knew nothing thereof before. You see, these generations, this generation that's coming up, they must grasp these great truths of, of the gospel for themselves. God said, I'm going to leave these people. Oh, hallelujah. Help me preach, Lord. I'm going to leave these people here so that these generations coming up won't just hear the history of what went on. They'll learn how to put on the armor and man the shield and the sword and fight the enemy for themselves. Oh, glory to God. You see, each generation must learn. They must pray it through for themselves. The danger is, sin mommy Lord, the danger is they grow up among us. They learn how to walk the walk. They learn how to talk the talk. They get the dress code right. But the crisis comes after a while, and they've got to decide, amen, for themselves. It's not a creed, but it's an experience. Amen. You see, this generation must fight the enemy for themselves. We've wanted to run interference for them. We want to say, now don't, don't question it. This is the way it is. But what they don't, what don't understand is uh, you've got to pray it through somewhere for yourself. You've got to have your own Bible and your own altar and your own place of praying to get it prayed through. When the preachers gets these young preachers gets it right, we'll quit getting book reports that they learned in college and we'll get what thus saith the Lord Almighty. They must learn to fight the Canaanites of unbelief for themselves. I believe Brother Charles said something to the fact that uh, when he was trying to emphasize the resurrection. We believe the historical fact, but it's getting it from here to here that matters. We have raised a generation that know what the book says, but they don't have any heartfelt Holy Ghost convictions uh, that will make them live what they know. What we know, the difference in what we know and what we live is killing us. Amen. They must know what heresy is. An old gray-haired preacher said to me, a man was of great reputation and he was preaching about the Godhead and he was denying the deity of Christ. And this old man said to me, Great old man. He said, I know he's wrong, but I don't know why he's wrong. I understand 
We have lost the basics. I feel like, God help me to be sweet tonight. I feel like that we have traded the great doctrines of theology and we have turned our services into entertainment instead of conviction. Amen. We must, they must know how to fight heresy. And they must once again be able to defeat worldliness on their own. For you see, we are asking a generation to live a vision they have not seen themselves. Brother Brent was in school, secular school. And believe it or not, he was a pretty good barnyard basketball player. And so the coach at school took notice of him. And he said to him, now, Brother Brent, I'd like for you to play on our team. Now, now, now I know your dad's a wholeness preacher. And I have somewhat of a wholeness background, so I understand some of the objections he's got. But I feel like that if you'll let me talk to your dad, that I can explain to him how we'll let you dress out in full dress. And my son said to him, my son said to him, Sir, you don't understand. This ain't my daddy's conviction. It's I prayed through that competition sports is wrong for a Holy Ghost filled Christian. And some of you might ought to try to pray through on that. And it's also this is wrong to know what the score is when you ain't playing. I felt a few cool breezes on that. I don't know where he's at. They ask us about, uh, you know, said, well, said, you're, you're from wildcat country. And uh, uh, you know what? I didn't know who, who does doing what or where. And I, you know, I didn't care. But you see, Proverbs 29 and 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no prophetic insight to what's going on. They cast off all restraint. We're fighting worldliness. We're fighting the dress of the world. We're, we're constantly talking the clothesline because the reason we're having to is they never prayed it through on the altar. Amen. They bypassed sanctification, went straight on to, to shouting and shaking. Amen. And don't realize. That's why it's so dangerous to let your young people go to where these charismatics are leading the services. Old time heartfelt Holy Ghost salvation is not a feel good drug. The prophet Joel declared unto us that in the last days that there'd be young men who would see visions. I declare unto you, I challenge you tonight to pray through till you see the vision. You see, my generation, we've handed you the dream. We've told you of what God has done. The psalmist that I read from tonight was not, not concerned about the, the older generation, but they had failed some way to communicate to the new generation that God didn't die when the old gray-haired preacher did. Amen, that there were still things to go on and God was still moving forward and he was simply looking for a people, amen, who would pay the price and seek the face of God and he'd do it again. I've told you the dream. And we've lived the dream. The old men have dreamed the dream and we've seen it come to pass. But now it's up to you. You must see the vision for yourself. In the year that King Uzziah died, this mediocre prophet, this average preacher, went into the house of God. He 
his, his uh, political aspirations had died with his king. They had lived a, a great political time of prosperity under Uzziah. And so when Uzziah died, this young preacher went to church and he said, when I come in, uh, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his terrain filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one having six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. We're going to populate heaven or we're going to populate hell. And I'm afraid we're going to populate hell faster than any generation before us because we've come to the place we simply do not believe without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. We've got the motions. And we've got the emotions. But I'm talking tonight, where is the vision? For you see, when he sees the vision of the Lord, when he looks at the power and the majesty as a post move of the door is moved and the voice of him that cried, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. The reason I know that you've not seen the vision is because you've not got a hold of the woe. And I still say a preacher ain't got no right to go till he gets a hold of the woe. Woe is me, for I am undone. For I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Ah. But then that uh, beast came off of there and it took the tongs and took a, a red hot coal uh, and walked over and touched his lips uh, and said, these uh, has purged you. And he said, uh, I heard the Lord say, who will go for me? And he said, here am I, send me. I'm, I'm going to tell, tell you tonight, when you get the vision right, uh, amen, you'll go out uh, and evangelize the world. Isaiah 6 so totally changed Isaiah until he became the greatest evangelist of the Old Testament and the preacher of the Old Testament. Hey Amen. When you read Isaiah, hey man, it's like reading the gospel. It's like taking a drink of fresh water. Hey Amen. Because he saw the vision of the Lord. And he said, here am I. Send me. Help me, Lord. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. Then why, why, why is there such a moral darkness? Not just in the world, but in the church. There's never, never has the world known such a darkness. The days of Noah and Lot have combined to produce the darkest time the world has ever known. It seems to me like that hell has absolutely unleashed, mounted a final attack to try to blot the name of the Lord Jesus Christ out of the world. Everybody talks about God. But there, I was in camp meeting somewhere. I was in a meeting somewhere in America. Young college boy there. I'd preached a little holiness and he'd got on the altar and got to praying and he prayed and everybody left and he's still up there praying and, and from what I could gather he was been a, a, a burr in everybody's saddle for a long time. And so uh, being the kind, considerate, and understanding person that I am, I went up and tapped him on the shoulder. I said, hey buddy, get up and let me talk to you. He began to tell me, he said, well, uh, you know, uh, 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 I, I just wonder if I'm sincere enough. He said, you know, he said, uh, 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 do, we, do we really know? He talked about the Four Eastern religion. He talked about all these other things. He said, they're so sincere. They're as sincere as we are. I said, son, maybe it's time you got out of that college and got some neathology. 
I said, it ain't nothing about sincerity. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the difference. The difference between us and them is, amen, that we worship the Lord Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. And with Thomas, we cry out, my Lord and my God. That's the difference, boy. There's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. That's why they're doing everything they can in the hour we're living in to put the light out. Amen. To not mention the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh. In 2 Chronicles 28 and 29, we have the story of a man who set out and did everything in his power to destroy the worship of God. Ahaz was 20 years old when he came to the throne. And for 16 years, he did everything he could to destroy the worship of Jehovah. He nailed the door shut. He put the lights out. He brought a new altar from down. Ah, how many times have you heard lately, preacher? This old, this old way ain't working. We need something new. No, sir, friend. Amen. I still believe that there is a, the doctrine that changes everything. Amen. Is Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Amen. Lived a spotless life. Died on a cross. Got up off that the third day. Amen. And went to heaven and sent back the Holy Ghost. It's the same gospel Paul preached and it still works. Give me that old time religion. Maybe it's time we had some soldiers. Hey Amen. There's so many sissies. I am so tired of going to meetings and listen to somebody almost say something. I am so tired of us testing the wind before we decide where we're going to stand on. I tell you what, I'm going, to stand, I'm going to stand where the Bible stands. And wherever that puts me, that's where I'm going to be. Amen. I'm going to stand, amen, on the word of God. Amen. No matter where it cuts in or cuts out. Amen. We need some men, amen, who know how to fight again. I've told it a hundred times. You, if you've heard our tapes and, and all this stuff, and I, I had no idea. The other day I found out I had 25 sermons on the, the worldwide whatever. I didn't put them there, but I don't have a premium on them. Right before, right before the Civil War broke out in America, Virginia Tech, Military Institute of Technology, Much of them southern boys had their butt ball. Every time something would come in, they'd hear something else. And there came a day when they refused to march under the flag. There was a, a teacher there named Andrew Jackson. We know him as Stonewall. The commandant sent to him and said, listen, we've got a problem. Said the southern boys on campus today are refusing to march under, in, in order under the flag. Said, can you do something with them? Mr. Jackson walked out there where they was at. He said, boys, said, what are you doing? He said, Virginia ain't went to war. Virginia has not seceded from the Union. Now you boys straighten up and be gentlemen. Gentlemen of the South. Go back to your classrooms and respect your teachers. Sure, and he said, yeah, but one more thing. He said, if Virginia ever does secede, if Virginia ever does call on you, come out of your classroom, amen, take out your sword, throw away the scabbard, and fight until there's not an enemy left. I would to God tonight that somebody could hear the bugle call, amen, <coughs> the trumpet sounding, amen, and would come out, amen, with a new vision of God and say, live or die, sink or swim, I'm going to fight this battle. <coughs> I'm not giving up anything else. I'm not backing up on anything else. 
there's not one sin unconfessed and uncovered going to that city. I preached, I think, at Richland years ago on a promise. We'll leave the lights on for you. And I think I've endeavored with everything in me to let the light shine. We've left the lights on. But young people, young men, it's up to you to let the lower lights be burning. It's you that's got to flower up the lights now. Hey, man, you've seen the lighthouse. Hey, man, you know what the lighthouse can do. But it's you that's going to have to guide them into the safe harbor with the lower lights burning. And so I'm challenging us tonight. Hey, man, you've got to do it. God ordained it this way that you've got to pray it through for yourself. Hey, man, I don't live this way because my pastor preaches it. I don't live this way because it's a holiness doctrine. I live this way because I prayed it through on an old-fashioned altar. Got a born-again, sanctified, Holy Ghost for baptism. Hey, man, that'll keep me in the cold hours. Hezekiah came along and he said, it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord to turn again away his angry anger from his people. The problem is, it's not in your heart. We've got to get it some way, not just in the head, but in the heart. It's not just a catechism. It's not just something I know how to confess. It's not something I learned in Sunday school. It's something I prayed through on an old-fashioned altar and got the experience for myself. Help me, Lord, to be sweet right here. I preached for some folks somewhere in America with a Charles Barnett. They told me that when I started preaching a born-again experience in that meeting, they told me that their kids, said our kids, I've never been lost. He said they just grow up to a certain age, put their hair on their head, start wearing shoes. That's a, and down the line they went and said, uh, said we just don't have the world in us. Said we said that's why we don't fellowship you fellas. I said let me tell you something, sir. The world is not out there. The world is in the heart of every one of your children. Amen. And if they don't get a born again blood ball experience, they're going to be the worst bunch of perverts that ever come up. Amen. You know why? Oh, help me out here. You know why? Amen. That all these sexual sins are raising up among us. And because we're pre- we have never prayed it through to realize, amen, that there is a keeping power of the Holy Ghost that will keep you in this wicked hour that we're living in. I challenge you, these young men, to see the vision. Stand by me, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let the Levites clean and relight the lamps. Let us rekindle the altar fire. It's in my heart. It's in my heart. My dad may have done what he done, but it's in my heart to turn this nation back to God. It's in my heart to live holiness. It's in my heart to be a man of God. It's in my heart to worship him and send the truth. It's in my heart. Amen. Get it in our hearts. Where there is no vision, we cast off all restraints. We've lost the fear of God Because we don't believe in the sovereignty of God anymore. We don't believe that God is still God. And he says what he's not a big sugar daddy somewhere in heaven. He says what he means and means what he says. Amen. And I want you to understand right now there is a keeping power. Amen. That will keep you in this world. I write unto you fathers. Because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you've known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Glory to God. 
Amen. God, give me a bunch of people. Give me a bunch of young men and young women. Amen. That are sold out to God. Amen. That say, take this whole world and give me Jesus. And I won't turn back. And I'll charge hell with a squirt gun. Amen. With him at my back. Amen. God, give us a vision again. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I saw the glory. I saw the power. I saw the anointing. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I've seen him tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. And his truth is marching on. I'm not interested in just handing you the book of the answers. I want to hand you the book and says, find the answer. Pray it through. I had no hold of this background. Taught to hate it. Taught that it was the offscaring of society. The ignorance gone to seed. Brother Charles, when I was, by the time I was 20 years old, I'd been doing speed so long that I couldn't remember. I'd been an alcoholic. The year I got saved, September the 3rd, 1970, I had not, I don't remember having a sober day from Christmas the year before till September the 3rd. But when I, when some good wholeness people, my brother in law and others, got to fasting and praying and brought conviction on me. And I made my way down beside an old platform rocker. Hey Amen. At 263 Russell Avenue in Franklin, Ohio. And there beside that thing I prayed through. Hey Amen. To a born again, blood bought, blood washed experience. Hey Amen. You know what I did? Hey Amen. The next night I was in church. Hey Amen. They took me to church that night. I mean, I sobered up, cleaned up a little. And there's a church over in the plat having church. Prayer meeting night. The first sermon I ever heard from a Pentecostal was on tithing. Well, that'll get you. Yeah. And I thought it was wonderful. I thought, well, man, what a good deal. Yeah. He, he takes 10, I get, what a good deal. The devil took everything I had for a long time. Yeah. But when I really got it. I grabbed an old book. I knew I couldn't go back like I was. I knew I couldn't live like I was living. I knew I couldn't be what I was. So I grabbed that old black back book. Amen. Went down to the barn. Crawled it on the altar. Threw it open to Genesis. Read it through the Revelation. Amen. I, when I read it there, I said, that's the truth. God's talking to me. I read my way through the sanctified life. I read my way through. I'm telling you, you can't read this book and not be holy. God, give me a new vision. Let me see the vision. Let me catch the vision. Oh, God. Give me some young men that are strong, that have fought hand to hand with the enemy and overcome the wicked one. Standing in the house of God with their battle scars, but proud that they fought the battle and won the victory. Amen. Amen. That this generation might know. Holy Ghost spoke in prophecy to my wife. And she was struggling in a sick spell and other things. And Holy Ghost spoke to her and said, I have renewed your strength. And I have anointed you. And I'll give you words. And said, you'll take this to another generation. We'll teach another generation. <laughs> Let's teach this generation how to shout. 
Dad come out of there and teach him how to do the dance. Marry him, grab your tambourine and say, you ain't never, you've been slaves for a long time, but I'm going to teach you how to shout. I'm going to teach you how to worship God. I'm going to teach you how to sing the song of victory. Amen. And let's shout again. Let's leave them. Amen. The light's on for them. But oh God, that they get the vision for themselves. When they do, the battle's over. He preached to us last night on having our eyes anointed to see beyond. I challenge you tonight to say, God, give me that vision. Let me have the vision. The prophet Joel said I could have it. Amen. He said I could have that vision. And I want it. I want that vision. I want to see it. I want to see that truth in the word of God. My covenant was simply. I knew I was called to preach before I got through reading the book. I said, I'll never preach anything I can't read, no matter how popular it is. But I'll never fail to preach what I do read, no matter how unpopular it is. They told me I'd been born to 100 years too late. I said, no, I've been born just exactly for such a time as this. And I am set for the defense of the gospel. I'm old enough that I don't want to fight, but I'm still young enough that I know how to fight. And so I can tell you and the devil, if you want to fight, bring it on. Because I refuse to give up one more thing. Amen. I believe we're on the verge of revival. And I believe they're going to come hunting, not for some, not for some sugar-coated, evil believism, but they're going to come to where the old-time power of the gospel is still a moving. Church, I'll tell you what I'm seeing in ordinary services down yonder last week at brother at brother Farrell's um, funerals. There, there was an old sister I'd known 20 years ago. She'd had a heart attack, had open heart surgery. For 12 months, she'd been on the only step she could take as they pushed that thing, let her walk, push that thing, let her walk. She got, on, on a Sunday night, we got just a little, not near what you had here tonight. I mean, we got just a little of that moving, that chariot rolling. And I looked coming out of the back. I don't know how she'd got up, made her husband get her up or what, but here she come. She pushed that thing right up to me, looked me right in the eye, and she said, I'm tired of this said, I want you to pray for me that God will heal me. So we began to pray for her. She shook a little bit. We prayed and she shook again. She looked at me again. She said, you want this thing? I just reached out and got it. When I did, she started walking. She walked all the way down the aisle. Hey Amen. Shouting, I can walk. I can walk. She walked back up the aisle. They nearly got to loosen that place and got to shouting and praising God. Hey Amen. But the simplicity of it is, if we we'll present the gospel in its power and its purity, hey Amen, with nothing but exalting the Lord, he'll stretch forth his hand again and we'll see a shaking and a stirring. And these kids will catch the vision of what you only dreamed about. Stand with me. I don't know how long I've preached, but I've done. This is the message God dealt with my heart. Father, why are we losing so many young people? And he said, we're losing because you're handing them the answer instead of giving them the book. So tonight I challenge you to God to come on these altars and say, Lord, touch my eyes like the man of God said last night. But God, give me a vision that will change me from the inside out until where I'll say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Amen. Amen. Somebody come and get us a song. Somebody come and get us ready to sing here. And I'm going to challenge you. Will you? Will you dare? Will you dare to ask the Lord to search your heart? Have you ever dared to say to him, Lord, no restraints, nothing held back. I want to see you, Lord. Oh, I want to see you and look upon your face. I want to behold you 
until I'm changed into the image of you. Till I go forth from this place tonight saying, take this whole world, but Jesus. Until I go forth saying, I proudly bear the marks of the soldier of the cross. Amen. Young men, the holiness church has seceded from the world. It's time you come out of your sealed places, of your crystal chandeliers and padded pews. It's time you pick up your sword and say, God, give me victory or let me die right here on the battlefield. But live or die, I've run my last time. It's a fight to the finish. As they sang the song tonight, I want to open the altars. Amen. I want to challenge you, young people of Pesley. But I want, to, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to see a vision you've never seen before. Whole of this is not, it's not a burden. It's not a restraint. But when God touches you just right tonight, it'll no longer be a controversy either. It'll be settled forever. Come on, church. I write unto you, fathers, because you know. Let's pray these through again. Let's gather around these altars and pray as we sing the song tonight. Let's ask God to help us. Don't let me stay the same.